And um, while they're getting the chairs in place, I'm going to go ahead and start telling you a little bit about our next panel. And then um, once our five panelists see that the chairs are in place, just come on up here and, and you guys can all come up at one time. So. Uh, we've talked a lot, um, had a lot of discussions so far about protecting the horse and rider, and now it's time to delve into integrity and security, protecting the horse certainly, but also the integrity of the race. And for this discussion, our presenters are, first of all, Rick Bedeker, uh, past president of Hollywood Park. He's held positions with Breeders' Cup, NTRA, and TVG, and his brother Bob Bedeker is a great handicapper. Many of us are familiar with having seen him on TVG. He is now currently executive director of the California Horse Racing Board. Another speaker is Dora Delgado. She's worked for Breeders' Cup for more than 35 years and now handles the position of senior vice president of racing and nominations. And her list of duties at Breeders' Cup are so long, I'm not even going to begin to read this. But if you would like to read that page, it's in your program. We're also going to be joined by Mark Guilfoyle who uh, has worked in various capacities as an official with the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission and Kentucky Harness Racing Commission since 1988. He is currently executive director at the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Uh, Guilfoyle is also an accredited thoroughbred standard bred quarter horse um, and quarter horse steward with the University of Louisville Stewards Judges Accreditation Program and the United States Trotting Association Official School. So he knows a lot about protecting the integrity of horse racing. Um, we also have Steve Cook, who grew up in Kentucky. His father, Gus Cook, was longtime farm manager for Claiborne Farm. So while Steve cut his baby teeth there, he did go on to serve 12 years at Canada's Woodbine Racetrack, where he was vice president of racing from 2018 to 2015. In 2015, he joined the NTRA and is executive director of their Safety and Integrity Alliance. Uh, last but not least is Corey Martinez. He's stable surveillance and third-party LASIX coordinator at Santa Anita. He previously worked as stable manager for Fairplex Racetrack in Galway Downs Training Center, and he's a graduate from Cal Poly Pomona. So if I could have you all come up, please, and take a seat. You all have microphones, and I'm sure that uh, you have already worked out which order you're going to present and speak in. This is, uh, Dora just said, I have no idea. So I'm going to stay up here just in case we need any help to start. But um, since Rick Bedeker's name is on this list first, I think that... I'll go first. Oh, I think, never mind. <laughs> We're going to change the order of that. We're going to go with Steve Cook first. <laughs> that was me taking control. <laughs> Okay, so um, the, uh, the Safety and Integrity Alliance is a very well-traveled initiative. We attend over 30 client racetracks, um, all of these racetracks at least on a biannual basis. Um, in each case, when we attend these racetracks, we are allowed full access to the racing operations and to the facilities with the intention to see how they operate and compare how they operate to their peers, how things really work. And I think this allows us a really valuable, a very unique industry uh, perspective that allows us to comment on um, a variety of industry developments. And so therefore our perspectives today are particular to the evolving role of um, video surveillance at our racetracks. So a few quick observations before I hand it over to the panel. Um, Again, all particular to video surveillance. The first observation that the Alliance thinks is important for you to consider is that video surveillance technologies are not going to be a replacement for boots on the ground investigative and integrity resources. So our message is racetracks and regulators, as you um, wade into these expensive installations, do not install lots of cameras with the idea uh, this mistaken intention that you're going to use them to offload um, what seem to be costly uh, 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 staff for um, traditional investigative integrity resources. So our advice is rather to treat these um, cameras as an ally. They're purely a complementary component to your uh, traditional resources. So it's going to remain critical for your integrity staff to maintain a presence, maintain that visibility maintain sort of that community 
um, policing aspect amongst the racetrack uh, community. I think what we're likely to hear today from this fine panel is that uh, they're, they're going to have examples where um, the sense of community in this presence really complete that critical uh, uh, feedback loop to the surveillance room and make it in effective. It's, it's your informants, uh, uh, informants, it's your boots on the ground intelligence, it's your community awareness that majoritively are going to trigger the most successful uh, investigative follow through, um, if not incident diversion altogether. Our next point is going to be always be sure to have the correct human resources backing up those new video installations. These cameras and these technologies are only going to be as good as the persons that are using and reviewing that footage. If there's no review of the cameras, then perhaps they're installed as a placebo effect, and that's somewhat effective, but probably not the original intention. Um, or if you um, have a, a more, uh, thoughtful lineup of staff that are competent and knowledgeable in the triple areas of horsemanship, racetrack community, and are themselves knowledgeable in the ways of a racing investigator. That to us creates this three-legged stool. And if you pull any one of those legs away, now you've got this two-legged stool and, and, and you're at risk of either not knowing what you were looking at or not knowing what you were looking for. So this point's actually very simple. As you install these things, have a plan for how long you're going to retain that footage. Um, the Alliance has experienced a couple of times where the uh, equipment was set on a seven day loop where it would re record over itself. And that's probably not going to deliver the best results for you. In horse racing, it's very common, it's very typical for racing uh, investigative incidents to trigger well after that seven days. Um, at the very minimum, we would say to you, consult with your uh, regulator, ask them how long is the local process to get clearance on the test barn and out of competition samples, because that's a very typical trigger, trigger for incidents, uh, investigations where you're going to need those video resources. Be very thoughtful, be very thoughtful on where are your highest priority installation locations for your cameras. So we would tell you, start with your stable gate, the ability to analyze your traffic patterns, the ingress, the egress of traffic is going to be a valuable, uh, interesting bit of intel anytime that you have a reason to look into that. The test barn, the test barn is a critical application for video resources, uh, surveillance resources. Here is where you can eliminate blind spots and that material is going to be a very powerful agent for you um, in those moments where there's a uh, sample chain of custody dispute. The um, shipment in the receiving barn. That is a location where you have a lot of different horsemen, a lot of different personnel sharing a lot of uh, a, 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 a relatively narrow space. Um, that traffic, that broad group of people, it can be a rich environment for trouble. Excellent place to put some good resources. It's common nowadays, actually I'll say it's, it's fundamental nowadays that you uh, audit your jockey scales. Having these resources in an audit process for jock scales actually eliminates the option for jockey weight controversies. The um, paddock is a high activity area, an excellent place to have extra eyes. And then once you have the opportunity to get down to the shed row or targeted shed rows, that's going to be an excellent um, um, tactic for incident diversion, uh, if not enforcement applications. And then finally, the last quick point we would make is consider how your video surveillance technologies, how that program can be a really a, a key component with a, a well-considered, thoughtful in today program. So, um, in today signage is excellent. Make sure that your racetrack community and all your stakeholders understand what the in today signage is about. What is your in today program? What's it mean? What's it for? How does it work? 
If you put these in today signs on the stalls, now the uh, surveillance operator has a very clear indication where are these horses that we are wanting to watch. It's an excellent, significant stride forward to really make that 24-hour pre-race integrity process very, very uh, meaningful. Now, as we thought about the points that need to, to uh, be discussed amongst this group, I mean, to be honest, we've seen things I think each of us can go on for a very long time today, so we won't. Um, it, but I do think it's better, let's now actually hear from the group here that can give us some, share with us some very rich firsthand in the field experiences. So the Alliance loves, the Safety and Integrity Alliance loves, uh, inter the Safety and Integrity Alliance loves the investment that the Stronach Group has been undertaking at their racetracks in uh, Florida, Maryland, and California, in particular in California. Um, Rick and Corey here have some very interesting experiences that I think we will uh, be interested in hearing um, thanks to the benefits of that uh, surveillance program available at Santa Anita. Um, Dora on the far end here for the Breeders' Cup has been responsible for what is effectively the, the, the absolute hands down best practice uh, race day security integrity initiative at the Breeders' Cup. The things that they have going on with that program absolutely set the best practice that this industry can take many uh, best practices from. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Goyle, Gilfoyle from the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission can comment on some very interesting practical applications for our consideration, and including some commentary, I think, on how existing uh, boots on the ground resources integrate with uh, surveillance resources. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Mr. Bedeker from the CHRB. I think I'll come up there. Thank you, Steve. I realized that if I sat there and held the mic and had to use the little clicker for the slides, that that would be beyond my capacity uh, from a coordination standpoint. So if you'll forgive me, I'll stand. Um, there's just a couple of things that kind of dovetail into this topic pertinent to the CHRB. One from a security standpoint is a terrific program that my predecessor, Kirk Breed, put into place at CHRB several years ago, and that is the Safety Steward Program. We now have uh, seven different safety stewards in the state. We always have one at each operating track. And, of course, we have in California, we have north and south. We have day and night. Uh, so there are always four working all the time. Some of those things that you see on the uh, slide uh, I won't dwell on. But the two or three that pertain specifically to security are obvious. Uh, obviously, graded stake security, our safety stewards uh, coordinate the program with the racetrack. Uh, using our investigators as well as the other people that are brought in. So it's, it's a, a great direct connection by the board uh, with the protection of those horses in those bigger races. Uh, also, uh, if you skip down to monitoring of race day restrictions, this is a key one. Our safety stewards are instructed to spend the vast majority of their time, particularly in the morning, in the stable area, and they're monitoring uh, with particular attention, the horses that are in today. And so, you know, there are restrictions that apply to those horses. Certain things can't be in the vicinity of those horses. And we've had several instances where safety stewards uh, have come across uh, situations that uh, either were violations or potential violations. And in the one case, they may simply issue a warning to a groom or the trainer, but in other cases uh, where a violation is clear, then the safety steward becomes the eyes and ears of the investigator, and the safety steward will immediately call an investigator and then secure the area, uh, take a picture of the uh, licenses of the uh, licensees in question, uh, take a picture of whatever the violation might be, and make, make sure that the location isn't uh, disturbed prior to the investigator getting there. He'll also notify the stewards. Uh, and so that is an offshoot that I'm not sure was contemplated when the safety steward program was introduced. But it's, it's very helpful. In some situations, um, and I left out, by the way, the safety steward will also contact the official vet. In most instances, the, the vet 
uh, will simply may be made aware, but may ask the safety steward to follow up with certain things, as, as, a, as might our investigators. And we've had at least three situations that come to mind where after an incident, we went to Santa Anita to the surveillance room, which you're about to hear about in more detail, and were able to go back and look at a particular situation and in some cases find a mitigating circumstance uh, that worked to the benefit of the licensee. In other circumstances, uh, actually showed us what we suspected happened. Uh, it's a great resource that we, we and we try not to uh, abuse that relationship between the regulator and the racetrack, but uh, we have a great level of cooperation there. Also wanted to bring something up that uh, when we talked about this panel a couple of weeks ago on a conference call, I mentioned this at-risk program that has been introduced in California, and this certainly pertains to the safety of the racehorse. Dr. Arthur uh, is responsible for putting this program together, and it really took shape following a really horrendous season a couple of summers ago at Del Mar that it turned into national news. Uh, there were 17 horses lost uh, during that short meet. Um, it was a very, very difficult thing for everybody involved, certainly everybody that cares for racehorses. But as a result of it, uh, he went to work and he put together a program that identifies horses at risk and working with Encompass. And I must say, every time we make a call and say we could really use some help uh, putting uh, a database together or getting some information, uh, we get nothing but enthusiastic cooperation uh, from Jockey Club and Compass Grayson Foundation, whoever it is. And so he put together a target list, if you will, of any horse that is a maiden, uh, four years old or older, that has never started, uh, any horse that has not started in 120 days or more, uh, any horse that has been eased, put on the stewards list for poor performance, on the vets list, or has otherwise been earmarked for a, a more uh, thorough look. And these, these horses um, are, represent about 15 to 25 percent of the horse population. Uh, it's a lot of horses. But then the program kicks into gear, and all of these horses must be examined by the veterinarian, the official vet, working with the track vet, uh, more than once prior to being allowed to enter a race. And it's a very simple thing where simply, in most cases, a horse is brought out of the stall that looks like a race day exam. It could very well be that this horse has simply been freshened, has been sent to the farm for 120 days or more, and now is back. But more often than not, the horse is out of competition because of some pre-existing issue. And so those are identified. The vet talks to the trainer about that. It could very well be that the trainer isn't aware of what the particular issue is, uh, simply was aware that the horse had been off and has come back. Also, the racing office gets involved. Um, vets during the, that will work during the day are now aware of a horse. In some instances, a horse is put on the vets list. There are very few. More often than not, a uh, horse has been looked at and has been cleared to enter, and then there will be horses that the vet will say, I need to see this horse another time before the horse is allowed to enter. Uh, sometimes, it's only been an incident or two since we've been doing this uh, over the last year, sometimes the veterinarian will require that imaging be done. That's very rare. We're bringing veterinarians in uh, with the help of safety stewards on dark days so that we can get all of these uh, examinations done. And since we began this program a year ago, it has had a distinct, made a distinct improvement. Uh, and I think the reason for it is that there is there's a, an increased awareness on the part of not only the trainers and the racing office who will be involved as we examine horses, uh, but also the veterinarians associated with those horses, the private vets. And then if you think about it, if a horse is, is on this list, this, this, uh, these horses that are determined to be at risk, uh, by the time that horse comes over on race day, he will have been examined in the morning on race day. Now the veterinarian in the paddock on race day is aware of this horse. Uh, the track vet, as the horses are warming up, is aware of this horse. And here's the best part. In the years since we started this program, 
we have seen a 35 percent reduction in fatalities among racing and training horses. And in California this year, in the calendar year, we have seen numbers that are the lowest, uh, fatality numbers that are the lowest in 11 years. It's logical that paying more attention to the horses that are at our risk, at, are at risk, uh, will protect them. And it's been said numerous times today, I'm guessing it applies to just about everybody in the room, the reason that people get involved in racing in the first place is generally because of a love of the horse. So this is one of those rare issues uh, where everybody uh, can get involved, be supportive, and it's even rarer that you end up with results like these. Who's next? Well, this is a change of pace. Usually I'm tucked away in my little surveillance cave and no one knows that I even exist. <laughs> so, um, so that's a picture of the, of the surveillance room and all the cameras and screens. Uh, it looks like something out of the born identity, but it's not. It's there in Santa Anita. And uh, I, I wanted to touch on what I found. So this is the second year that it's been in that it's been uh, operating. And I've found about three areas that have benefited the most from having the surveillance system. First and foremost, it was race day integrity, integrity in general. Uh, the second was risk management. And the third was uh, security of the stable area. And like Steve said, it was a it's a group effort between uh, the state vet, the safety steward, the investigators, stable security, uh, my LASIKs team, uh, and the, the stake horse surveillance that's there on stake days. And I, I'd, I'd like to share with you a few uh, clips that I've collected uh, over the last two years that, that really helped drive the point home. So in this first clip, you can see that's the track vet doing his morning pre-race checks. And uh, that's one of the, the first lines that I find in the morning is he'll be looking around and he'll notice things that may be out of, out of sorts. He might notice something in uh, where they keep the leg wraps. He might notice something in a bucket and he'll give me a heads up and I can pull that up to a, another screen and keep an eye on that and see uh, if they pull anything out and if they use it on the horse or. And then the next level is, uh, that's one of my Lasix vets going to give a Lasix shot. And then you can see the, the stake surveillance over there sitting on the corner getting his paperwork ready. And uh, the Lasix vet, he'll notice things too. He'll, he'll let me know if he notices blood on the horse's neck when he goes to give the shot, which means something may have been administered pretty recently. So I can go back and look at the footage and see if that's true or not. And then the cameras really help with Lasix because, um, because of that specific timeline that it has to be given in. I can notice when uh, it's taking too long to find an attendant or the horse is being too difficult or something is causing a delay, then I can use that as coordinator to, to maybe switch things around and have, other, have the other vets and the other techs treat a horse if we're getting close on time, getting close to that four hour mark. And you can also see that uh, the LASIK vet holds up the syringe so that it can be on camera. And if, and if there isn't any point where he's having a difficulty with the trainer, he can also look up at the camera and say that, kind of make a motion or something to that effect, saying that he was there for LASIKs. Uh, they didn't want to give it at that time because sometimes they want to delay it 
is close to that four hour mark. So we have them sign the, the slip that says they declined LASIKs at that time, but there's also the video proof that it wasn't, the LASIKs vet was there at the at time, but it was declined. Okay, in this video you can show, I mean this is, this is just routine medication administration, but you can see what the cameras can show you. Um, there they're giving paste, and uh, this is what I look for uh, early in the morning or on the day, race day, and or if, if the CHRB investigators come with me, say there was a bad test that they got the results for, then they'll give me a time frame to look at, and this is the type of thing that I will record in a report, and I'll give that to them so they can use that in their, their hearing when they bring it to the stewards. And another uh, advantage to the camera system that I found is risk management. And as you'll see, um, there's a lot of accidents sometimes, and you can also record what happens, the time frame, the EMS time frame, like when they arrive, when they, when they're there on scene, and you can all keep that for your records, because. And I'd like to add that the, the rider was fine after this incident. He was on the ground winded, but he was fine. So a lot of times the track will hear that it took hours for the emergency crew to get there and the person was lying there in the mud, like in agony, waiting for help. When, when you look back at the video, uh, they were there usually like within 30 seconds and then if they had to call an outside agency, like in, in our city, Arcadia Fire Department, they're usually there within a couple minutes and they're there on scene. And with, from a risk management perspective, we can have the, the documentation that shows that yes, the emergency personnel were there in a timely manner. And our stable security has also found great benefit to the camera system. For example, um, there have been fights, there have been thefts, there have been all sorts of things. And usually when they would take these matters to the stewards, it was usually like um, one person's word against the other and they didn't really have that much evidence to to go to. So now that we have these videos, uh, they can show this to the steward and see exactly what actually happened. So for Breeders' Cup, um, Steve had, had referenced the fact that we use best practices and are kind of a um, model for um, those best practices around the world, and we had to do that by necessity. Um, going, moving our event around from track to track meant we have to integrate in not only the racetracks protocols, but the host racing commissions uh, protocols. And sometimes it's a good meld, and sometimes it's a difficult meld. But what we've tried to do over the past 35 years is take those vast best practices and incorporate them into Breeders' Cups um, programs for safety, security, integrity, um, everything that's important to horsemen. If they're going to pick up and travel around the country and come to our event and have their horses compete on a level and, and fair playing field, we need to make sure that we've provided those circumstances to make sure that every equine athlete can compete at that level. And that also includes, of course, our international competitors. They wanna make sure if they're coming to America that although we allow medication on race day, we're gonna pr 
provide to those equines a, a level playing field so that they don't feel like they're at an, a disadvantage. We're going to show them that security is going to be on these horses and that the surfaces are going to be in the best possible condition and our veterinary teams and our security teams are all going to be um, the most trained and highly qualified individuals that are available. And how we do that and how uh, one of the things that Mark and I are going to discuss today is that when we come into a host racing jurisdiction, our teams are there to complement theirs. We're, we don't come in to take over. We don't come in to say it's going to be Breeders' Cup's way or the highway. What we want to do is take whatever best practices they have and elevate them to a level that we all are very comfortable with. And one of the things that we've offered over these 35 years is to say, if we've, if we've found best practices, say, in California, and we're running in Kentucky, are there anything that those racing jurisdictions can learn from one another? Um, the camera system at Santa Anita uh, was just so incredible that we knew that we would love to duplicate that at other racetracks, but the infrastructure, of course, had to be there. So when we came to Keeneland, they made an incredible investment in their property um, and, and did high-definition uh, wiring down at the Rice Road location so that we could have all the Breeders' Cup runners in one place. And we bought the camera system, installed it. We had a great uh, video software team that came out and trained not only our investigators, but the Kentucky Racing Commission investigators and um, horsemen if they wanted to get online and also look at their, at their horses in their shed rows. So it was just an incredible um, opportunity to give that. And we, and, we, and we borrowed that from Santa Anita. So, you know, what we want to make sure is that the only thing that, that we have to offer um, to bring new fans into this sport and to bring new owners into the sport and to make sure that horses are crossing state lines and flying internationally to compete and to show up at all these big events is that they're going to get there and they're going to have the highest levels of safety for their athletes. They're going to have surfaces that are fair and consistent and, and above all safe and that the, um, that the combined uh, staffs of, of track uh, organizations such as Breeders' Cup, the Racing Commission, are all working together. When we came to um, Kentucky this year, and, and Mark and I started discussing, you know, there, we bring in a team of, of veterinarians from around the country and overseas. And this is because with over 200 pre-entries, there's a lot of horses to get eyes on for a full week. We don't just want to concentrate on race day exams. So those horses are going to be looked at under tack, on the track, in the shed row, hands-on, physical exams. And in order to do that, we supplement the, the Racing Commission uh, veterinarian team, and we meld those two teams together. We've got great cooperation with Dr. Mary Scholey here um, and Dr. Rick Arthur in California, who, who allow us to bring our Breeders' Cup veterinary team and marry them to the host track team and the host racing commission team and they all work together they work every day together they do exams together they sit down they have meetings together they compare notes they enter information in the uh, equine databases and it's it's such a good opportunity to not only learn from each other but to to um, absorb those best practices from other jurisdictions and and you know if we have um um instances where we can offer instruction and say, here's how Breeders' Cup does it while we're in Kentucky. Maybe there's something we can bring to California to make sure that they're also um, at that level where we are all, so that it's, it's a very similar program. When they're coming to Breeders' Cup, there's no surprises. Obviously, every racing jurisdiction has their own uh, rules, their own, own protocols, but if we can make sure that we're all working together where they where they feel like it's a, a concentrated effort, it, it makes everybody feel good and it makes it gives horsemen a, a real um, confidence boost. Um, and the same thing goes with our security teams. We have 72 hours out from, um, from Breeders' Cups post times. All horses must be on the grounds. They're going to be under a security watch for 24 hours a day. And in order to, to do that many security officers, obviously the, the track and, and racing commission are not going to be able to provide that. It's um, um, over 150 officers doing round-the-clock shifts. So um, 
what we end up having to do is, of course, um, supplement that with third-party security teams. Sometimes um, when we were here at Keeneland, we managed to get the National Guard. We had some Marine Corps volunteers in California. Sometimes we do um, outside security firms. But that first layer is then um, overseen by a secondary layer of Breeders' Cup trained investigators who are, who are security and, and law enforcement personnel from around the country. There are um, between 10 and 12 of those investigators that also come to the event, and then they coordinate those security officers and with the um, actual Racing Commission investigative team. So it's a three-prong effort to put security on those animals 24 hours a day. So in 2017, we had a protocol change um, where we wanted to make sure that we were in receipt of any out-of-competition testing uh, results. And the reason that is is because we're not a, a regulatory body, when we go into a host track racing commission um, and we're working with them on possible starters, we want to make sure that all our uh, horses that we've tagged throughout the year as possible starters are getting pre-tested before they come for performance-enhancing drugs, steroids, et cetera. Um, but because of racing commission rules, we were not allowed to have those results. We changed, uh, we, we instituted our own rule, our own out of competition testing and hired a, a racing uh, testing coordinator who did an amazing job last year. We had over 195 horses tested and 95% of the trainers that ran in Breeders' Cup had at least one horse tested throughout the year. These tests um, included, like I said, possible starters, all our challenge winners, anybody that we thought was targeting Breeders' Cup as an end of year goal, we made sure that they got out of competition testing and all those results uh, were clear. So our condition of entry also was new last year, um, and this uh, was a ban on any horse that had, been, had used steroids in the previous six months from competing in the Breeders' Cup. Um, we just wanted to make sure that there was no lingering effects from a horse that may have had a therapeutic usage of a steroid. We wanted to make sure they were not running on that. It was very important um, for our competitors and in our, our international competition that we could assure them of that. Um, that no horse was going to compete while they while they did that. Um, we're also, of course, very uh, strong supporters of the um, Medication Uniformity uh, Horse Racing Integrity Act. Um, Craig Frabel, our president and CEO, just recently spoke in Washington on behalf of the of the uh, bill. So in 2018, we'll continue to do our out of competition testing. We we have our our condition of entry. Um, Dr. Mick Peterson will um, come to Churchill and, and test the services periodically throughout this year. Um, as I said, all horses are on the ground 72 hours out. Uh, we're, we're in a little bit of a bind at Churchill. We don't have the ability to put all of our Breeders' Cup runners in a concentrated space like we were at Keeneland and at Del Mar. Um, Churchill has the same um, issues that Santa Anita does in that they're um, base of trainers there don't allow us to empty a, a lot of barns to accommodate all these out-of-town horses, which can be up to um, 75 or 80 competitors shipping in. So it's a little difficult. Of course, it makes our job a lot easier if those barns are concentrated and all Breeders' Cup runners are centrally located for the vet teams and security teams to make sure they, they get um, um, around quickly to see all of these animals. But we are faced with those limitations at these tracks. Um, so, like I said, we expect over 200 horses. We have 14 championship races this year, including um, uh, our brand new race, the Juvenile Turf Sprint. We'll have 50 runners from international locations. We'll set up a temporary USDA facility on the grounds of Churchill Downs. Um, all of these runners that ship in have nearly all of them have competed at grade one level or grade, um, or at least the group or graded uh, stakes level. And they'll all have been, most of them will have been tested uh, at this point through their out of competition testing and they will have um, had those results back. Some of these horses will be tagged for secondary testing. Um, we wanna make sure that anybody that commits to coming to Breeders' Cup um, is assured of making uh, of, of the very safest, secure, um, highest level of integrity when they come to run with us. Thank you.
Hello, I wasn't planning on getting up and talking. I was in my own little safe box over there, but I guess since everybody else did, I might as well too. Uh, I don't have a slide presentation. Uh, if I did, it's feet on the ground. It would be just a bunch of people walking around, so that wouldn't, nothing glamorous about that. But I do want to talk about feet on the ground. Um, in Kentucky, we are looking at, our chairman challenged me about a year ago to look into surveillance systems and cameras and whatnot. And uh, me and one of my fellow commissioners have looked in and met three times with a video company and we went with a, what we thought would be the greatest thing in the world and then we knew we would have to back down from there. So we're in negotiations with them, trying to get where the horsemen, the racetracks and the racing commission or the state all go in together. So we're all in this, all in the, in the, in the game together as far as money wise goes. Of course, that's usually what keeps people from doing stuff like that is when it comes down to the dollar. But I, I think I've got it figured out where we're going to get the money at. But anyway, back to feet on the ground. I'm, I'm a big proponent. I'm old school. I grew up a long time ago where that's what we did. We walked around a racetrack and I tell my director of security, you better wear a pair of shoes out about every three weeks, you know, so keep walking. This whole business is about relationships. Um, if I walk into Graham's barn, and obviously he knows me a little bit, but if some of his people there don't know me, they're, all of a sudden they're going to, who's this guy? And the flag comes up and the guard goes up. But if you get a, get a relationship with these people when you walk around the racetrack, every day they see you. You know, we know that um, it's a real tight-knit community down there, and obviously I look at it as the regulator is part of that, that tight-knit community. So you got to get to know the people because there's a lot of people, there's very few cheaters in this sport and like I said I think I've been around long enough where I've earned the right to say that but there's people that they'll want to tell on somebody but if they don't trust you that, that you might flip them or something they won't they won't say a word so you want to be get the relationships back there and um, and get your snitches I hate to use that word but your snitches I used to back when I was a was a standard bread judge at the racetrack there's always somebody that's always trying to borrow money you know it's five dollars a week five dollars a week so I used to take the theory out of my own pocket. I'll just give them 20, that way I'll never have to see them again because they know 20 that I'm gonna be looking for them. Then I got to thinking, well, with that $20, I'm gonna get something for that. So I'd you'd say, all right, I'm gonna give you $20. We need $20, but I'm gonna need something in return. And it might be minor, it might be something that leads to something, but you utilize, you're not using people, but you're utilizing them. You're, you're developing a friendship, you're developing a trust where they get to know you. There's a there's some small minor things that you might want to overlook that you know somebody has a hot plate in the barn or something you sort of tell them just to get it out of the way i'm not going to turn you into into the uh, racetrack security to get you a ticket or get you thrown out of the barn but then you got to work with me or work with us on our team and dora made a really good point earlier when you know we, we host breeders cup in kentucky not as much as we want to but anyway we'll work on that later that uh she brings her security team in and, and I love it. I love working with those guys. You know, you got like Juan Dominguez up in New York. You know, the New York trainers, they know him. They trust him. They'll come talk to him before they'll come talk to me or our security team. So it's real good that you, you spread the wealth around. You know, when you, Mike Hopkins from Maryland comes in, he knows, his, he knows his horsemen there. And they're more apt to tell him if something's amiss other than they will come to our team. So I like to, to put that where we really work together, everybody. It's a... Uh, it's a pretty simple sport. You know, I tell, tell my staff all the time, we've yet to split an atom in this building, and we're not going to start today. Let's just keep it simple, feet on the ground, walk around, make the relationships with people, get to know everybody so they'll be more apt to come to you and say, you know, this guy over here is not doing right. Would you, would you mind looking into that? I used to tell people, just slide a note under my door. You don't even have to say who you are. Tell me what's going on. Make it easy on me. You know, if there's something they're using in their barn, tell me what drawer it's in. I don't want to go tear a barn apart. But we want to go look at that drawer and find and and find that. Uh, another, with the feet on the ground in your security, I feel like you, you really need to train your security, regardless of who they are. It, even if they're horsemen, they've been around a racetrack. That you need to really train them what to look for. And as my good friend, rest his soul, Ned Bonney used to say, you don't want to flinch because if you walk into somebody's barn and somebody's doing something and you flinch, the game's over. They they got by with it. It's done. It's it's disposed of. There's nothing wrong. I tell my guys if they come in, they think something's wrong or a needle's getting ready to go into the horse's neck or something, stop them. Just stop them and let our vets come check because if it's a LASIK shot or something, if it's three minutes late, it's not, it, that's not going to matter. But you want to stop them before they do something. When I was working with, uh, with New York at the Belmont oh, probably five years ago, uh, I was in a gentleman's barn. I just happened to be in there, and, and they were getting ready to give a shot, and I asked the veterinarian. I said, what is that? He goes, legend. I said, well, hold on for a second. 
I knew, I think, in Kentucky, our rule was 28. In New York, I think, was 48. So I called, uh, I forgot who it was. I called somebody in New York and said, what, what's the deal with this? And as I'm keeping this guy's horse from being scratched in a $2 million race, I'm looking across the barn. I can't get over to the next barn over, and I can't think of his name, and everybody probably know it. I think it was a $3 million race his horse got scratched out of because they gave a shot of legend to that horse, and I think the New York rule was 48 hours. So it's, um, everybody needs to work together. Like I said, it's, it's, it's not a real difficult thing to do, build relationships. It's, uh, I, I hate to oversimplify things, but that, that's sort of the way I look at it. You've got to get those relationships built. Uh, part of our feet on the ground program is our veterinarians. We give third-party license. Uh, we've been doing it for probably six years in the standard bread side. We've been doing it since I've been around the commission since 88. Uh, their, their feet on the ground. You know, we'll have anywhere from three to six, six veterinarians, depending on how big the card is of the day, giving veterinarians and they, or giving LASIK shots, and they'll, they'll do, divide the barn area up in quadrants, and that's how they give it. So that, that's feet on the ground. It's, it's more of a deterrent because they're walking around, and you never know when somebody's going to walk around the shed row. That's what we want to do is keep people, from, keep people from being nefarious. If they know the deterrent's there, they're not going to try to do it. Uh, I'm real happy about the microchip thing because I think one of the, one of the problems that I, I foresee as a problem is people leaving the grounds with horses. I don't, I don't want to give a trainer an unfair advantage because he has to go by the rules because he's on the grounds where somebody's at a ship in place or somebody leaves with a horse and say, this is Mark's pride I'm leaving with, and it's not, and they leave, it's a horse that's in to go, and they go do whatever they do, the shockwave, for example, and they come back on the racetrack. I think the chip, the microchip is really going to put a, put a hurt on that one so that they can just zap the horse and figure out who it is and know where he's leaving or coming or going. And uh, the veterinarians are, like I said, our state veterinarians that give LASIK is a very, a very important part of that. They'll take when they give the shot. It's not an indigo sign, as somebody was showing a minute ago, but it is. They'll put a, a colored piece of tape on the stall that say that horse has been given his LASIK shot so somebody don't come back and double give it or whatnot. But that's sort of an indigo sign. So, you know, when their security is walking around and they can see that pink tape or green tape, depending on what color, they know that that horse is there, that's in there. And then um, I'm going to leave you that. And I think Dora and myself are going to discuss some things with Breeders' Cup. But uh, that is. Uh, the feet on the ground are, are, are very, very, it's very important. It really is. The cam you have all the cameras in the world. you got to have somebody watching the cameras, but just the relationships that you build by walking, just old-fashioned walking around the barn area. And it's, it's a pretty good thing to do, too, so you get to meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of people and, and get those relationships. Thank you. I just want to jump in really quick with a couple questions. We received specifically talking about cameras, and I'll ask them both and then um, let you guys have a discussion on. But the first is um, how many cameras are required for adequate coverage in a barn area? And to follow um, kind of with that, it was talked about targeting monitoring in particular shed rows with cameras, asking about which procedures have you used to determine which barns might need so, um, additional surveillance, how is that achieved, um, and then also what information would you have to receive if you needed to perform a pre-race scratch for security or integrity reason based off some of the information you've received off those surveillance. So I'll leave you guys with those few questions. I won't. So for a number of cameras, it depends on the barn. Uh, in one of the barns of Santa Anita, there's up to like 40 cameras because it's so large. But then in another barn, there's maybe 15. So I would say on average, it's about 15 to 20 cameras per barn. And you can see in the way they're set up is that you can see every stall and, and you can see every horse in every stall. We've tried. It worked. We've tried uh, covert surveillance at, on an ad hoc basis uh, using cameras that uh, we, we purchased a couple of years ago. And the difficulty is that the barns are always full. Uh, so you have an opportunity in, rarely in Northern California, you, have a ra you rarely have an opportunity to get into the stable area when nobody's there and put up cameras where you'd like to put them up. Obviously, if the people know that they're there, it's not going to achieve its purpose. So it's a very difficult thing to do on an ad hoc basis. The system that 
Santa Anita has uh, is the ideal. It's the gold standard. And obviously it's owned by the private association. It's not owned by the regulator. Uh, so we're very careful about going in in a particular situation, looking for a particular video, uh, not simply going in, you know, watching hours and hours of live um, of live camera feed and trying to catch somebody. Uh, so uh, the, a specific allegation about something going on in the barn area where you'd like to go in and put a camera up at the top of the stall, it's very difficult to do, if not impossible. Re regarding the question, how many cameras are required for adequate coverage of a barn, I mean, um, I got a little distracted, so I think I, I, I missed some of our comments there. But, um, you know, it, it's going to depend on your goal. Um, when Breeders' Cup was at Keeneland, um, not that I should for, speak for these guys, but I did was very well aware of what they had installed. It was fantastic. There was cameras looking down every single shed row. And, of course, those kind of open barns over there on Rice Road here at Keeneland are um, made for a pretty compelling picture. You could see the stall door for 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 every stall, and that was very valuable to both the Breeders' Cup, the integrity team, and the horsemen were given access to those cameras. They were able to, at 3 o'clock in the morning, if they wanted to pull those images up on their, their cell phones, they were uh, welcome to, and I think that was uh, uh, an appreciated thing. Um, it, it, but, but so that's every stall, and, and that's helpful if a stall has an end-of-day sign on the front of it. That helps you kind of laser focus on that stall if you want to. Um, then again, if you're trying to do something more uh, covert or, or, or um, you're after something in particular, you're working on some intel to have uh, cameras in every stall, well, that'd be amazing also. You know, there's another bizarre, uh, barn design where if you go to um, Florida and Maryland, the Stronach Group has put in these very, very big, um, um, I'm not sure how to describe these, these big white barns that have uh, uh, over a hundred something horses in them and they're very tall structures and um, the cameras can go in the peak of that structure looking down at the stalls and you can see dozens of stalls if not a lot more than that with any one camera and that's just a phenomenal total coverage situation so there probably is no particular uh, answer for that. For the horsemen themselves um, I always have been surprised that more um, outfits don't just have their own portable systems um, trying to cover their their own operations and having sort of a, a sense of security for everything that goes on in their own shed row. Um, I personally am kind of a high-strung individual. I, I wouldn't sleep at night with uh, that level of responsibility for those horses being worried that anybody can uh, come down my shed row. So I'm always going to be uh, very interested in what's going on there. I've completely lost track of Kathy's other question that was on her cell phone there. I think this question, maybe um, Mr. Guilfoyle might start with you. There's a question here. What information would you have to receive to perform a pre-race scratch for, scratch for a security or integrity issue? Well, to start with, we would um, take a veterinarian, take one of our commission veterinarians with us. And it's, it's really a tough question to answer because they're – People think they see something a lot of times, and it's really not what they see. Or, in to the to the vice versa of that, they'll see something that may be nothing that they report. It it could be something that's pretty nefarious. But uh, it, it's a case by case basis. You know, if somebody if, if there's a horse um, with like after a veterinarian's been there to give to give Lasix, and they put whatever color tape of the day is on the door of the stall door, and then uh, somebody sees somebody coming out with a syringe or, or going in with a syringe or something like that, then we would go down. Obviously, you know, you, you, you start your investigation. You look for needle marks of blood on the neck, whatnot, ask a lot of questions, try to get there as quick as you can to confiscate whatever whatever the syringe is. Now, if you do come out with a syringe, I mean, that horse is going to be scratched. Take your commission veterinarian down there with you, you know, that, that can ask the vet questions, but there's there's no – I think I read something the other day where, where – um, situation happened with uh, some, something given to a horse inside of the, I think it was a 24-hour rule and uh, didn't scratch a horse and it turned out to be in a pretty, pretty bad situation. So you don't, you, don't, you don't roll the dice on that when you scratch the horse. 
and then you turn it over to the stewards and you know let the stewards adjudicate how they feel you know they'll, they'll get all the facts of the case but I don't think you can ever go wrong by scratching the horse yeah we look at it the same way and I mentioned with the safety stewards uh, we've actually had several incidents where a safety steward has noticed a topical application uh, that's not permitted and pursued the, the substance you know called in the investigator the official vet and 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 that has resulted in the scratch of a horse we know that the safety stewards a lot along the lines of the cameras that serve as a deterrent so do the safety stewards we know that that's the truth because in a couple of our stable areas as the stewards turn into a shed row whistling starts and it's a little alarm system for people that might be at the other end of the shed row. Uh, pay attention, uh, and it's a good thing. It's I don't mean I don't mean that there's somebody cheating down the shed row, but it's just you know it's it's an awareness of the presence of the safety steward, as I said before, as an extension of the investigator. Uh, I think the cameras are the same thing. You're, you're you know, as I think Mark said um, earlier, we got very few cheaters out there. That's okay, that's great. That means a lot of the systems are working, the protections are in place. That always, but that doesn't mean that we're not trying to, you know, uh, continue to have an advantage. And I think that's what a lot of these things uh, end up being for us, simply acting as a deterrent. And the few people that do cheat are gonna have to think long and hard before doing it. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the um, safety stewards again, because it kind of puts me on the, a soapbox. Uh, speech here the um, where there are safety stewards so um, talking about uh, the California racetracks um, New York has a safety steward um, I don't want to list them all but let's just talk about for example Louis Hargy safety steward Southern California the very existence of that position and then having a, a very um, passionate and um, experienced individual in that position is a very powerful thing, a, 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 a substantially important outcome for the integrity and the quality of your racing. The, so uh, part of his job is to be a steward, and, and they are eligible to go to the stand, although I don't think that's um, uh, to the steward stand for the races. I'm not, that's not a critically um, compo critical component of the role um, as far as what my mindset is right now is that you're really doubling down on the community policing, um, the community uh, visibility of your integrity and your safety program. And this individual is looking out for everybody. He's making sure that we're not putting green exercise riders on green horses. He's uh, helping horsemen look out for themselves. He might be enforcing um, shoe rules. Uh, he might be um, helping educate someone that um, has something not, not quite thoughtful going on in their shed row. But it's just this, this broad presence that can be a all hands uh, everywhere, um, uh, uh, have this all hands everywhere effect for the regulator. And it's very difficult for the, the stewards themselves to get out of the um, hearing room or the race office, uh, the steward's office in the morning. Uh, hard for them to get out of, the, impossible for them to get out of the stand in the afternoon. So they don't, at most racetracks, are not going to have the opportunity to really com create that, 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 those relationships. Um, too often everybody's coming to the stewards when they're in trouble. And it doesn't have to be that way. So that safety steward rule is just a magnificent stride forward for any racetrack. Any time a racetrack can put that position into place, um, I, 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 think, I think it is, is, cannot be overstated as, as a, a, a added to, a addition to the racing, a quality addition to the racing. Let me, I want to make one more point about that, and, and you mentioned Louis. Louis, of course, a former rider for many years, uh, and Mark talked about relationships, knows everybody in the stable area. You know, we have, a, as I suppose just about every jurisdiction has, uh, investigators that come from the outside. They've, in our case, generally served for another law enforcement agency for 25 years or more and then they come into our world and in their previous life they've been enforcing the penal code then they get into our world and it's like kind of like coming to a small town you know we have a community we have a different culture uh, we're really talking about usually medication violations most of which 
our mistakes. Uh, and so it's, you can't be heavy handed with these things. And if we only had investigators, we'd have to do a lot of training to make sure that that didn't take place. But with the safety steward, uh, our other ones, uh, uh, David Noosh, former rider, Paul Atkinson, former rider, um, Richard up north, you know, was a racing uh, secretary for a long time and a trainer. So they know the culture. They fit right in. They're respectful of the people that are there. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons it's, that it's worked so well. There is a, um, you now I'm going to self-promote, I suppose. There is a proxy program where you don't have the resources to have a day-in, day-out safety steward. And, and, and that's kind of a role for the Safety and Integrity Alliance uh, at the NTRA. So... I think one of the important reasons we get invited the way we do to work with all the racetracks that we do is because we are this um, broadly experienced expert set of eyes and ears. We can come to your racetrack, bring our um, uh, panel with us, and we can look all the way across your operations and, at least for that moment in time, help uh, execute that role of that safety steward and point out the things that um, you really might want to take a second look at. Um, you think you've been doing it, maybe it's lapsed. Um, maybe there's a new best practice we just experienced two weeks ago at a different racetrack we were at. And gee, you ought to really call that guy over there because we think we have a great idea to solve that problem for you and et cetera. So it's, it's kind of like we're playing a, a proxy role for the safety steward when you don't have that person there every single day. And then once we leave, um, my phone never stops from racetrack GMs across the country going, what was that thing you told me again? And who's that guy? And what's that number? And et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, I don't know that, that, that the idea of safety stewards particularly contemplated um, originally with the Alliance, but, but that has been a, a key evolution of what we do. And so when I see an effective safety steward in the field, um, uh, a person like me gets very, very excited with that, that, that quality system. And I want to touch on the relationship between the surveillance room and the safety steward as well. Lou, I'm always in constant communication with Louie. He'll, he'll call me up and say, hey, I'm going through this barn. It didn't look right. Can you, can you keep an eye on it? Can you, keep a, can you put up an image on the screen and just watch it after I leave to see if they do anything? And, and there's other instances like on rider safety where he's caught someone. He didn't think they had their... their safety vest on, and uh, so he'll say, hey, can you check the film? And so I go and check the film. I follow him back to the barn. First thing he did after talking to Louie was run into the, into the tack room, and then you can see him putting on a vest. <laughs> so there is a perfect example of the relationship between the surveillance room and the safety steward. Dora, I'll go ahead and throw you on the spot here. I'm thinking of the Breeders' Cup integrity team, and... and um, uh, a lot of that crew are very close contacts uh, uh, of my own. Some of those guys have traveled with the Alliance. They are uh, security integrity experts in their own way. And I just wondered if you wanted to expand any, uh, on any comments on having um, the right people trained in the right way or how those, those career experiences have really uh, benefited that program and grown that program. Sure. Well, one of the key components of Breeders' Cup is that we borrow heavily from other organizations, associations, and commissions. And we have to do that because we're such a small company. We need that expertise brought in from um, various racing jurisdictions, law professionals, veterinarians. They all bring the power of their uh, experience to us, and it's, it's invaluable. So when we bring in, uh, for instance, uh, Mike Kilpack, um, former California investigator, Don Aarons, current director of um, Sam Houston Security. All of these guys that come in to us take their vacation, take their time off, and devote um, an entire week to Breeders' Cup to make sure that they can give us that security force. And, and, and we honestly could not, literally could not do it without them because we overtax the host track and the racing commission as is. They just simply wouldn't be able to handle another influx of, of up to 100 horses that are not normally their population. Um, you know, we, we have about 95 to 100 trainers, um, you know, and their help and their, you know, jockeys and owners and connections. And if we didn't have all of these um, racing jurisdictions and these tracks in, in North America overseas sending their best and brightest to us, we literally just couldn't get it done. So 
when I said earlier that we borrow heavily from you know 35 years of experience, that includes these these um, experienced professionals that lend us their time to make sure our event is the best it can be. A, a, a added point to that is this is um, this this event integrity team is available at a racetrack near you. It's kind of a group of guys that half gun will travel, half badge will travel maybe. Um, this is a crew you can connect, I, I can connect any racetrack with uh, Mike Kilpack um, and they can assemble a team and a program for a particular event in time or through the alliance we can come and help you do a security, uh, an audit of your procedures, integrity procedures and security practices at your racetrack. And so it's kind of a, a way to rent that Breeders Cup experience, if you will, um, for your moment in time or for a broader uh, sort of a consultation impact. So that is something to consider if you're a racetrack operator out there kind of wondering just where you stand and how you compare. One more thing on that too. The, um, the veterinary team has worked so closely with uh, the equine medical directors of our host racing commissions that the injury management protocols that we implement for Breeders' Cup are just um, the best that there's going to be. We, if, if we haven't thought of every you know, uh, situation by now, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to think what one might come up. Famous last words, I know. But that's a close um, partnership between the, the host track, the host racing commission, and the Breeders' Cup veterinary team to make sure that whatever circumstance we can dream up in our heads, that we've got a plan and a protocol for it. Um, that's also freely available. You know, these guys have worked very hard on this plan. They're very proud of it. They would share it, I mean, freely with any other racing jurisdiction if they needed help for a special event or they just wanted to implement best practices at their own track. Everything we do at Breeders' Cup, we want to make sure everybody has um, the ability to, to get those protocols, those programs, read through them, ask questions. I mean, we're, we're definitely there to make sure that everybody's got um, the best program available to them. Okay, I see from a flashing red light, I think we've uh, fulfilled our hour. And um, obviously, if you see me in the hallway and you have more thoughts, myself, Dora, uh, Mark, Rick, and Corey, I think all of us are very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for coming. And the last thing I'll say on that um, be, uh, before you guys run off is that they mentioned a lot of jockeys who are overseeing, former jockeys who are overseeing the uh, things that happen on the backside of safety stewards. But Juan Dominguez, who you mentioned, was my agent at one point. And the guy who sort of oversees things at the backside of Churchill Downs is a guy named Bill Vest, who I've known since I was 13 or 14 years old. He worked on the gate crew at River Downs when I first met him. So the point to this is if, if other racetracks are listening and thinking, well, where do we get these people? I think that you could work hand in hand with the NTRA and with the backside population to find just that right person or people to, to get your own safety stewards at your own track. Thank you, guys. And now we're going to take, wait, I think Steve had a comment. Do you have I was simply going to comment, it's a workforce development program. Yeah, there we go. So now we're going to take a break until 3.30. Uh, come back, uh, take a little break and come back. Thank you.